Q&A. If you press the Q&A, um, you'll be able to type in your question. And what we shall do is um, answer it in a, in a typed fashion. We have a team of people who'll try and answer them. But as I said, we'll also then pick out some of them to discuss during the question and answer session. So please do ask anything um, through that uh, facility. So we're going to begin properly with a little candle lighting ceremony. It's, it's no accident that we hold this event, I suppose at the darkest time of the year, it's the time of year that people can find very difficult. The days are short and Christmas is, is on the horizon and certainly people can find that time of year difficult. So into this darkness, what we're proposing to do is to light some candles and to bring some light. Candles, they represent, I suppose, a range of meanings to people. It, it can be, as I said, just a, a chink of light in the darkness. A candle could be a symbol of hope. It's also an opportunity to just to pause and reflect and maybe pray. And then often we also light a candle in tribute and in memory to a person who died. So you might be thinking of all of those things, even in your own home, when you're, when you're lighting a candle this Christmas. A core message from this evening is that there are people out there to help. And there are a number of different bereavement organizations represented here this evening. So for the candle lighting ceremony, I'm going to invite them one by one to come into the screen and light their candle. And when I'm inviting them in, I'll tell you a little bit about what they do. So we're going to go into, um, first of all, in your gallery view, I'll invite in Anne Staunton. And Anne is going to turn on her camera and light her candle. Anne represents rainbows and rainbows works with people, with children, sorry, um, who have been affected by loss, the loss through separation and loss through death. If you're there, Anne, um, welcome on screen. Hey, <coughs> sorry, Orla, I am on here. Uh, uh, I'm having some difficulty. With your, with, don't worry. We, uh, well, with my video, with maybe, your video. maybe I'll... I'll try it just once more now. Sure, but you, you can me light your... The host, your, the you host can, has stopped it, so uh, okay. I'm lighting my candle, Orla, for I the think time. That's the I'll spirit. get on in a moment. That's the spirit. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for the work that you do. I'm now going to invite uh, Bernie Carroll from Pieta House to join us. Hello, Bernie. And Bernie works with people who've been bereaved through suicide, um, as to her colleagues at Pieta House. Thank you, Bernie. Mm -hmm. And now I'll invite Colleen Brown from Bernardo's. And Bernardo's run a bereavement service for children. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you. And I'll now talk to Emer, Emer Ivory from Purple House Cancer Support in Bray, where they run a local bereavement service. Orla, I am here, but okay. my, my screen is coming up that the host has stopped my video. Okay, maybe so, Jen, if you could um, attend to that and open the video for Anne and for Emer. 
And if you want to uh, open or light your candle, Emer, in the meantime, um, so that in the spirit of it, we have you. And th there you are. Thank you, Emer, from Purple House Cancer Support in Bray. And thank you for what you do. I'm now going to invite Mary Squires from Taurus Lakela in Kildare. Hello, Mary. And Taurus Lakela provide bereavement support, again, run by volunteers, trained and of a high quality. So welcome, Mary, and thank you for all you do. Now I'm going to invite you, Norma, from Embrace Farm to light your candle. Um, thank you, Norma. And Norma's organization, Embrace Farm, works with families who suffered a bereavement through um, a farming accident. Um, and we're thinking of your people today as well, Norma. Thank you. I'm going to ask now Lorraine from the Irish Hospice Foundation to light her candle. And Irish Hospice Foundation is hosting this evening. Thank you, Lorraine. And finally, I'm going to invite Maura from the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network to light her candle and Maura works through ICBN with all of the different organizations that support bereaved children. And we'll ask maybe that you take a moment to just reflect and look at how the accumulation of candles throws a little more light, a little more support than when we're on our own, a single candle. So we're going to take maybe just a 60 second reflection um, reflecting on the, the candle and the power of light. Thank you, everybody. And those candles will be with us through the evening. And um, so even while we can't see them, we know that they're they're burning um, in reflection and tribute. Thank you. So we're going to begin by talking about children and how we can help them. So I'll pass you over now to Maura Keating from the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network. Thank you, Maura. Thanks, Orla. Um, as Orla said, my name is Maura and I look after the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network. We're based within the Hospice Foundation. Um, we're funded by the Child and Family um, Agency, TUSLA. We wanted to just start tonight with some information about the children in our lives, because we know that for every loss, there's always children and young people affected. They might be your grandchildren. They might be your nieces or your nephews, your neighbor's children or your own children. We know that when we're living with our own grief, it can be very hard to get the energy just to function on a day to day basis. And sometimes, to be honest, there are days that you just want to stay under the duvet. But the reality is for many families, the, they have the added worry of how are the children coping? We know as adults that grief can be extremely overwhelming. And children feel this too. They just deal with it a little bit differently. They don't wade through that sort of river of grief that we often do as adults. They tend to dip in and out of it. 
So sometimes it appears the children aren't really affected by the death because they seem to bounce back quite quickly into that play mode. However, they usually do this as a way to protect themselves from the actual pain of feeling the grief all the time. It's like they have this inbuilt radar to stop feeling the pain and it's just too hard to feel all the time. So they use play as this outlet for their grief. So messing with their friends, going to school and playing generally distracts them and takes their mind off things. But of course, we all know you can't hide from grief all the time, that it sneaks up and catches up on you. And with children, this is often at night time when all the distractions of the day quieten down. Um, and that's when we often see outbursts. And these outbursts at night time often come in the form of sobbing tears. It could be them expressing their fears, their worries, their concerns. But more often it comes out in their behaviour. They just don't know how to feel. They don't have the words to express the terrible mix of emotions that are going on for them at this time. So what can we do to help them understand and deal with these emotions? First, it's really important to talk to them about their grief. We know it's not easy. As adults, it's natural for us to want to protect children from the pain of grief. Sometimes we're afraid to talk to them in case we upset them. Sometimes we worry that we don't have all the answers. And sometimes we're afraid that it's just too hard for us um, and we're afraid we're going to break down in front of them. But, you know, particularly younger children, when they're not talked to, what they think in their little heads is, if mommy and daddy are so upset and they can't talk about it, then I better not talk about it. It must be something bad. So this causes a buildup of worry in their heads um, because they really don't know how to cope with their feelings. And again, we're not saying it's easy. It is absolutely normal to avoid wanting to talk about things that are going to upset ourselves or children. But in fact, talking can really, really, really help children, especially when we break things down, explaining them in, in a simple way can really ease their worries and their anxieties. And, you know, anxieties actually come from the unknown rather than the known. And something like death, particularly for younger children, is a very difficult concept to get your head around. And even sometimes the older ones struggle a little bit with it. They'll be experience emotions that are unknown to them. And as adults, we have to help them understand that grief. We, as adults, have experienced grief before, usually. But for children, this is the first time in their lives they're experiencing this, if it's the death of someone close to them. So we have to find ways to help them understand and cope. And, and you know, different ways to cope. Because we know that grief shakes their sense of security. You know, most of us have our children wrapped in bubble wrap sometimes and they grow up in this lovely sense of safety um, but when somebody close to them dies or somebody within the family that really can shake their sense of security they know now that bad things can happen to them so it it rattles them so they need a lot of reassurance talking and explaining things really helps and it's not just a once-off conversation we need to have you know, sometimes we need to repeat the information and break it down in lots of different ways because it is a big, it's a big thing for them to have to deal with. Younger children need very clear and simple and concrete words. So even though euphemisms sound softer and kinder, it's actually better for younger children if you're using real concrete words. Because those euphemisms, you know, might feel easier for us to say. But if we say to a little child, um, their daddy has gone to a better place now. What a little child hears in their head is, well, he mustn't have loved me if he's gone to this better place without me. Or why didn't he bring me to this better place? Um, sometimes we say things to children like, well, 
they're at peace now. They went quietly in their sleep. And again, particularly at night time, little children can often worry that that might happen to them in their sleep. Because these are abstract ways of describing what has happened. So being much more concrete and clear actually is kinder to children than we would think because it, caught, it, it, it breaks away that confusion and that potential for confusion and it allows them to feel secure in the known. It's the knowing what the information can really batten down that anxiety that can build up. So when we're explaining things, that clear language is so important, but also it's never going to be all in one go. So break it down into a series of steps, you know, build on the information like layers, almost like Lego blocks. You know, you start with your base layer and then you add more detail um, when it's needed and when it's asked for. A good rule of thumb is if they ask a question, they are ready for the answer. So don't assume sometimes that we, we know exactly what's going on in their heads because we don't know how they've interpreted the information. So another good idea is to ask them to tell you in their own words what they understand and what's worrying them. And you will find sometimes that there may be little things that they've misunderstood or misinterpreted um, that are causing them anxieties. So really encouraging that culture of talking is really helpful. Um, it's not easy. It's particularly not easy when you're very overwhelmed yourself, but it can really help children. Um, and in, in turn, it'll help you in your grief. I mean, I suppose it's important to remember as well that all children develop at different levels and different paces. Um, and they all have different unique experience on things. Some, depending on the type of relationship they had with the person who died, some children are talkers, some children are bottle things up. You know your own children best. Um, you know how they express their emotions. So respect that and give them the space to, to talk about things. We often worry as adults about showing our own grief in front of children. But again, they're going to learn from you. So it's OK to show your feelings because these are normal reactions to the sadness that you're feeling. However, I suppose it's important to know that as adults, we have to protect the children. Um, and sometimes when, it, when a death has happened, particularly within a family, um, a death of a parent, particularly children often feel they have to step up to protect the adult. And again, we need to remind children that they don't need to worry about you, that even though you're upset and you're sad, that you have your own way of getting support, that you have, they, they're not responsible for your emotional support, that you're still the adult and they're still the child, but that you have a way to get support for yourself, that you have other adults that you can turn to, other adults that you get your support from. And to let children know that so they don't, they don't feel the burden of having to mind you. And one of the things we say often is you can't mind them if you don't mind yourself and how important it is to look after yourself. Because the, the more you learn to cope with your own grief, the better it's going to be for the children. They're going to learn from you. They learn how to cope with grief within their families. Most children don't need to talk to somebody external for support unless there's particular concerns or stressors. So if you're interested in more information about childhood bereavement, I know that some of the people who are listening in, this may not be as relevant for them, but there may be children in the extended family or there may be other children that you might want to get information about. Feel free to contact me at the Irish Childhood Bereavement Network. Our website has lots of different information. It's www.childhoodbereavement.ie. I'm going to share with you a little, um, a short video that was developed with St. Francis Hospice Rohini, and it's aimed at teenagers and young adults. And it's, it's an insight into the way young adults think and feel 
when they're grieving. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about the supports that are available after this little video. So I'm going to take a minute. It's a short video. It's about three minutes long. Finding your way through grief. A book written by and for teenagers and young people. We are going to talk about what young people think has helped them through grief. We hope it will help you understand how grief affects us and what can help. Grief is a natural part of coping with bereavement. There are no rules about how we should feel or how long it should last. There are no right or wrong ways to grieve. Grief has many faces. It can be a massive bundle of emotions. Everyone grieves in their own way. In the beginning, a lot of the time, I just wanted to be alone. But now there's more times I want distraction of my friends as well. Common responses to grief are Shock, loneliness, poor sleep, feeling irritable, and lack of interest in things. Headaches, stomach aches, anger, and or anxiety. You might feel you've lost your sense of safety and control over your life. What helps? To understand this explosion of feelings are normal. Allow them to happen. Stuff down feelings do not disappear. It's okay to distract yourself from your grief and not to feel guilty that you are forgetting the person. If you feel guilty about certain things, especially at the end, remember your whole life with the person and not just the bad parts. Talk about your worries. It's important to talk even though it's really hard sometimes. It's easier not to talk and isolate, but if you talk, you can get help. Feeling overwhelmed and anxious is common when grieving. Anxiety is the mind's response to a fearful situation. Identifying your thoughts can stop anxiety spiraling out of control. Remember, even members of your family will grieve differently to you. It's really important to be aware of how we grieve differently. Otherwise, it will affect relationships in the family in a bad way. Grief and anxiety can make looking after yourself difficult. When my dad died, I felt I couldn't talk to people. I let it bottle up and it got on top of me. Because I wasn't talking, I didn't really understand how I was feeling. I tried to cope in a very unhealthy way to relieve pain, which didn't work and I just felt worse. Finally, I spoke to my cousin and then I got the help I needed. You are who you are because of the lives that have touched you. The things you have learned from them stay inside you and become a part of you. As time goes on, you realize that no one is completely gone as long as you remember them. So I just wanted to share that little video. It's something that we made with our colleagues in St. Francis Hospice in Rohini. And it's just a very short um, snapshot of what is contained within that little book. It's a new book that they've just produced, um, written with and for young adults in Ireland. Um, and there's lots of information in it. So any of you who have young children and young adults in your families, I would recommend that you get access to it. And it's actually available free if you go on to the St. Francis Hospice website. So it's www.sfh.ie. Go into their shop section, click on, scroll down and find the book. It's called Finding Your Way Through Grief and click on there and give your name and address. They will post you out a free copy of that book 
as a resource for you and your family. And I would recommend that, um, particularly if you have teenagers and young adults in your family, that you get it. There's some very good and useful information in it. Also here today, as Orla said earlier, are two other services that support children in their grief. That's Rainbows Ireland um, and uh, Bernardo's Children's Bereavement Service. And the details and contact information for all of us will be available at the end of the session um, alongside all the information for um, the adult services that are here today. So I'll be back later on for the questions and answer session. So if you have any questions for me, feel free to pop them in. Thank you, Orla. Thank you so much, Maura, and for um, just giving such tangible advice. Um, you, you all, one of the benefits of the fact that you uh, registered for this event by email, um, Iris, who organized the evening, will be able to send you on some of these details um, so that if you didn't manage to write down what the, the services Maura was talking about there, you will get them all on, on email. So thank you, Maura, and we'll pick up some questions with you later. So now um, I'm going to introduce to you Brefni McGuinness, and Brefni works with us at Irish Hospice Foundation as our National Bereavement Specialist. And he's going to talk about the adult side of coping with grief. Um, so great to have you, Brefni. Um, right. Hi, Orla. Look forward to hearing Lovely more. to be here. And good evening to everyone who is um, uh, tuned in on this online uh, webinar this evening. So I'm going to chat a little bit around how we can cope with grief. Um, and uh, I'm going to share a couple of slides here uh, around this when my screen decides to behave itself. <laughs> I suppose picking up on what Maura was uh, talking about there, and we would have seen from uh, some of the earlier organisations that are providing bereavement support, the importance of um, talking about our grief and the importance of uh, facilitating that, uh, particularly with younger people. We do that by uh, being able, I suppose, ourselves to acknowledge our own grief and how it impacts on us. So this evening, I'm going to have a look at a couple of areas, um, uh, three in fact, and the first one is going to be looking at um, COVID and how that has impacted on us over the last uh, two years and particularly in relation to grief. I'm then going to have a look at um, uh, how we cope with loss and grief and, and explore some things around that. And uh, finally, I'm going to look at preparing for Christmas. And again, I would encourage you, as Orla did at the start, if you have questions in relation to anything that's coming up in uh, what I will be talking about, please pop your question into the question and answer section. And uh, there are people who are monitoring that um, uh, throughout the evening. So I suppose, um, in a way, I didn't think I'd be talking about this in the same way this year as I was this time last year. I suppose none of us did and, and probably hoped that we wouldn't have to. But I suppose the reality is we're still living in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and some of what that pandemic has brought us, um, we may be aware of in our own personal lives, the, the changes, the constant, um, uh, I suppose, different advice and different restrictions. But there's another side to it as well. And this picture is a picture of um, Balali Church in Dublin. Um, and the picture is titled War, Wall of Crosses. Um, and what the parishioners in Balali did uh, when the first uh, Irish person died from COVID, they made a small St. Bridget's cross and they put it on the outside of the church. Um, and as of today, 5,707 people have died from COVID. Um, uh, since uh, it came to our shores in early 2020. There's been many, many more people who have also died during COVID. And that has been equally uh, difficult for people because of what um, COVID-19 has brought into our lives in terms of restrictions. But I put this picture up here because I think it's important maybe to stop for a moment ourselves and get a sense of the enormity of 
what we are living in and through at the moment. And particularly for any of you this evening who are dealing with uh, bereavements um, that may have happened uh, since COVID came along and even before. Um, I suppose just to get a sense of the magnitude of loss and grief that is happening uh, to us at the moment. And this is a quote from uh, one of the, the um, parishioners there around why they did this wall of crosses. Because each cross represents this grief, 5,707 people, these ripples of grief that go through communities and go through families. Um, so I suppose recognizing for ourselves, we are in extraordinary times, very difficult times. Um, and there's, there are times that uh, we, we have a communal um, uh, grieving as well around what is going on. This is one man, Alvaro Lopez, um, uh, who is originally from Spain, um, and he stopped by this wall of crosses. Um, he was just very struck by it. He said, the wall of crosses is very powerful and is very impressive. I've never seen as many crosses at the same time stuck on walls. I think it's a way to realize that many people are suffering, many people are dying. I think it's a good opportunity to pray for all these people. For example, my uncle in Spain passed away two weeks ago. This situation is very tough for everyone. Um, I suppose this is just one person's story um, of somebody from a different country living in Ireland whose relative has died um, and just how that loss ripples through into his life. Some of what COVID has brought to us in terms of grieving has made things more challenging and there have also been some opportunities but in terms of challenges I was even thinking about it today we're still in the midst of a pandemic there is uh, I don't know about you but I would certainly sense a, a fatigue an exhaustion a weariness we're almost two years into this and we're still uh, wading through it um, we're dealing with an unknown virus we're dealing with mutations of that virus there's a loss of control um, and it can bring up current losses and it can bring up previous losses for us. Um, just even the simple thing of, of social distancing and limited gatherings, um, although we have uh, it eased a bit earlier or maybe midway through the year, there were many times during this year where people couldn't be together. And people may have uh, not been able to be present when a loved one dies, or if they have, they may have been wearing PPE. Um, people may not have been able to attend or organize funerals, or they may have been different to the kind of funeral they would like to have had for their loved one. And people may not have been able to access physical social support. Um, for some, uh, people have had to grieve on their own. Um, and we set up the bereavement support line in June of last year. And it was interesting that on, on the bereavement support line, some people would say that being able to grieve on their own or having to grieve on their own was actually an advantage. They said, well, I didn't have to go and meet people and I just wasn't feeling up to it. And still others would say the exact opposite. They was precisely because I couldn't meet people that I found it so difficult. So I suppose it, it has meant different things for different people, but we do know that it has caused uh, extra complications. There has also, I suppose, been opportunities with COVID, um, one of which is a greater awareness of death and grief and the need uh, for support for each other and how much uh, supporting each other can make a difference. We wouldn't have wished this on ourselves or on anyone else uh, to, to have come to this awareness, but I suppose it's something that is there. Um, there's also uh, a greater sense of community. I know that's waxed and waned uh, over the different, uh, I suppose, phases of, of COVID that we've experienced. But there has been a sense, I think, of people reaching out to each other to each other more. We remember the postman last year and guards and people just going the extra mile and reaching out to others and being aware of others who may be on their own or who may be needing a, an ear or a kind word or a kind gesture or even just an acknowledgement of their loss. It's also given us time to reflect and consider what is important. Um, and I suppose the opportunities is there's always hope, hope that we will cope with this even though it mightn't feel like it at times, that we are uh, and do uh, have a resilience and the good sense of resilience of being able to navigate 
uh, difficulties that life throws at us. And I think it's important to be able to hold on to that hope, um, even though the road may be a bit rocky at the moment. Um, how do we cope with loss then? How do we cope with grief? Um, I'm going to play you a short video. And what I'd like you to do is just have a look at this and um, see what stands out for you. And if there's a question which comes up for you from looking at this video, please put it into the, the question and answer section. Listen, there's no right or wrong way to deal with the loss of a loved one. You can expect grieving to be rough and it's different for every single person. Another important thing, it's not just a matter of coping with loss. It's about coping with change. And that, Wellcasters, takes a lot of time. Today on Wellcast, we're dealing with a pretty difficult subject. How do you deal with the death of a loved one? How do you live your life in the face of a life-changing event? We don't have all the answers, and honestly, you're going to have to work through your pain in your own way, on your own pace. But if you're looking for it, we do have some advice. First things first, you need to remember that grief is a process and not a task. You might have heard of a popular theory that breaks up bereavement into stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. While you might identify with some or all of these steps, you got to remember that grief is less like a staircase and more like a roller coaster. There are peaks and dips and they don't always happen in predictable ways. You might feel better for a while and then worse, and that's okay. It's natural to have an uneven journey with your grief. Don't be afraid of the pain. You shouldn't try to stuff your sorrow away into a place where you don't have to deal with it. It's just going to stay there. In order for you to work through your grief, you're first going to have to acknowledge that it exists. There are a lot of ways to do this. You might have to be alone for a bit. Maybe you need to write down your feelings in a journal or talk to someone. Do things that make you happy. When you're grieving, it's sometimes difficult to hold on to who you are. After all, so much of your energy is focused on the mourning of your loved one which is fair, but it's easy to get sucked into a mind space where you can't even remember your former self. We want to tell you it's okay to take time to do the things that make you feel like yourself and give you joy. Recognize the relationship between the mind and the body. When you're experiencing grief, it's really easy to forget the things that you usually do as a matter of routine, taking a shower, getting enough sleep, eating. Neglecting your physical health is only going to take a greater toll on your mental health, which is taking a pretty significant hit right now. So do yourself a favor and do us a favor and make an effort to take care of you. It's what your loved one would want. Reach out. Wellcasters, if you take nothing else away from this episode, please remember this. You do not have to be alone in your grief. If your feelings are too overwhelming for you to sort out, that's okay. But go to someone else for help. It can be someone you know, a family member or a friend, or it can be a therapist or a professional who knows how to help people deal with this exact situation that you find yourself in right now. Just the act of talking out loud about your feelings can be incredibly cathartic. Finding someone who can help you sort them and work through them is even better. So uh, again, if you have some thoughts uh, or questions based on that, uh, or things that strike you about that video in relation to grief, pop them into the question and answer section. And um, there are people there who will take a note of them and we, we may come to them at uh, the question and answer section later. So I suppose just some key points around grieving, it's normal to experience intense emotional responses. There isn't a right way to grieve. So your grieving is very individual and you grieve your way. The important bit, again, a bit as more as saying in relation to children and adolescents, the important bit is to express our grief to others and to have that grief validated by others. 
And that's really important. And whether it's ourselves that are grieving and we're expressing it, that's important to do. And if we're supporting somebody, it's important to validate their grief and to listen to them. Um, also, just to go gently with yourself. Um, grieving is a marathon rather than a sprint. And it's certainly not done in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I'm going to show another um, short piece here. And this is in relation to the goals of grieving. What are we trying to do? Uh, and I suppose that the purpose of grieving is not to um, kind of shrink our grief or our memories of the person who has died so that we don't feel it anymore. Um, the purpose of grieving is really to help us to grow our world. And I like the idea of the jars as a way of symbolizing this. If you think of the two sets of jars that you can see there on the, uh, the slide, if you look at the jars at the top, this was a traditional way of looking at uh, the goal of grieving or the purpose of our grief. Um, if you think of the black ball as being your grief and the jar as being you, the person who's grieving, um, originally at the time of a death, uh, if you take the jar on the left, you can see that the black ball fills the jar. It's like the grief fills us up. And as time goes on, maybe a year after the middle jar, you can see the ball gets smaller and the grief gets smaller and we, we, we begin to feel a bit different. And then as, let's say, time goes on again, another year, the third jar on the right hand side, you can see the black ball is getting smaller. And this was a, a traditional way of viewing grieving. And the idea was to look over time, eventually we just, uh, our grief gets smaller and smaller and we hardly notice it. But of course, what a lot of people found was that didn't match their experience. And a different way of thinking about the purpose of grieving is the bottom set of jars. Um, and as you can see there, again, there's three jars. If you think of the jar on the left as being uh, you, the person at the time of the death, and the black ball is the grief. And then as time goes on, say the middle jar, we can see that something different happens. The black ball of the grief stays the same, but the jar gets bigger. And then as time goes on, maybe another year, two years after the death, look at what happens again. Again, the person you have expanded around your grief. Your grief stays with you. And grieving isn't about getting over a loss. Grieving is about learning to live with the losses in our lives. Um, but it's not just that we learn to live with it and we put up with it. When we experience a loss in our lives, it changes us, it changes our life and it expands our life. And that's the purpose of grieving is helping us to grow and expand our life while at the same time learning to live with and integrate our losses within our lives. So what helps when you are grieving? One, allowing yourself to grieve, giving yourself permission to grieve, giving others in your family, whether that's children, adolescents, partners, um, friends um, uh, as well, just giving the permission to grieve, allowing that, expressing your grief in your own way, taking care of yourself, looking out for others. And I hope this is something that may come from the pandemic is that sense of maybe looking out for others more and being aware of our interconnectedness and seeking support and avoiding isolation. Very important. I'm going to show a, a small clip here from a woman called Pauline Boss. And Pauline Boss has written a lot uh, around ambiguous grief and the importance of finding meaning when things don't make sense. And I suppose with COVID, we're, we're faced with a lot of things that don't make sense, and particularly death and loss that doesn't make sense. She has some really interesting things to say about this. Finding meaning is an important one, and it's the hardest one. How do you make sense out of a senseless situation? When I was a year ago in Japan giving this kind of workshop uh, to the therapists. And then there were many teachers in attendance in Fukushima. <clears throat> this man stood up in a question and answer session. He was a high school teacher in that area. And I'll never ever forget this man, a very articulate, um, in Japanese of course, so it was translated to me but he said that he himself lost 19 people of his family washed away, and three were still missing. And my, he was 
he had a hard time talking. But he said that was not why, he, that was not the core of his question. The core of his question was that his high school students, it was all boys, that they almost all had lost either both or some of their parents or siblings. And he said, how can I help them when I have this heavy burden myself? And my answer to him was, you must share your own loss with your students. Now that's very against the culture of Japan. Uh, so I risked saying this would be useful if your students knew you were also grieving and then they might open up the grieving for the human connection that they need. Well, Mr. Kimura just sent an email. <coughs> it was translated for me. He said, uh, Dr. Boss, I would like to update you regarding one of my students. As you know, I found him staying alone in the dark in the high school classroom. He told me that he didn't want to go home. This was after the tsunami. I decided to invite him to talk with me, and that's after he and I talked. And I shared my losses with him, that I lost 19 people and that three are still missing. He then shared for the first time that he had never felt it was okay to remember his missing mother. But after hearing my story, he started to feel comfortable to talk about it, feeling that it was okay to think about his missing parent. This past April, and by the way, that's two years and one month after the tsunami. This past April, after we had talked, he asked me to teach him how to play the guitar. So we started playing together. Eventually, he invited two other boys to join the practice. And now the three of them are playing all together with the music they chose themselves. He later told me that although his parent is still unfound, he often has dreams about her. In the dreams, he said, that she is encouraging him and is proud of him starting to play the guitar. So he wants to work hard to get better at it. That's how meaning is found in nonsense. Often through dreams, often through artistic endeavors. Um, Jim Gray's wife has found meaning through poetry. She has published several books of poetry in the last six years that are about ambiguity and the tolerance of it, but other things as well. You need to find control when you have lost control of the absence and presence of your loved ones. Writing poetry is a very controlled effort. So is playing the guitar. But other people find it other ways. So just know there are many ways to do it. So that's Dr. Pauline Boss. The reason I put it in there, I suppose, I was just so struck by the beauty of um, the, the teacher um, trying to help his students who are also trying to make sense. And this was the, the tsunami in Japan a number of years ago. Um, but what she said, share your grief and that will give them permission hopefully to share their theirs and i suppose for ourselves in covid many people are dealing with all sorts of losses um, and maybe there's a message there for us around uh, sharing our grief and being open about our own grief with others um, and, and giving permission to each other uh, to share our grief the other piece that i really loved about what she was saying was the finding ways uh, creatively to express our grief, whether that is through uh, music, whether it's through poetry or other artistic endeavor. And that way of um, turning our grief um, uh, into um, something creative and something expressive, I think there's good messages in there for us. So just to finish up in terms of preparing for Christmas, 
Um, how do we do that when we're grieving? There are a number of very good resources which are produced by uh, the Irish Hospice Foundation and also the HSC. You will get a copy of these slides uh, from Iris by email and you'll have the links for them there. I would encourage you to look at, at those resources. They're really good and uh, give some good hints around things that might help for Christmas. Some of the things that just to say, um, firstly, be very patient and very kind with yourself. Grieving is tough at times. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, and I know somebody was asking earlier on about how do you deal with a death a number of years on? Um, it's to be patient with yourself, uh, be patient with others, be kind with yourself and allow, uh, as we saw Pauline talking about there about that uh, young man in Japan, um, it took him quite a while to be able to open up and to be able to try and process and express some of his grief through music. So to allow that, be gentle with ourselves. Plan ahead for Christmas itself. Um, if you're uh, worried about Christmas or I mean, Christmas brings up all sorts of things for people, but having a plan can really help uh, and keeping it simple. Um, Honour your loved one. It might be lighting a candle or uh, having saying a prayer or saying something that uh, is uh, appropriate for you. Um, look after yourself, ask for help. Uh, the bereavement support line, uh, which we'll be hearing a little bit more about um, in just a couple of moments is there. Allow yourself happy moments. You know, even in the, the midst of terrible tragedy, there can be um, little kind of lights that might uh, come along in the day. So just to keep your eyes open for those. Do things that give you life, do things that nourish you, that um, uh, fill you up uh, and give yourself permission to do that. Reach out to others, um, get some fresh air, some exercise uh, and, and eat well. Uh, and where you can get moments of joy to take those. And accept that others have different ways of grieving uh, that might be different to the way we grieve. I'm going to finish with this piece around uh, self-care. It's very important. It's a lovely image that we, we use a bit in our training. Um, and it's the idea of you being a boat. And if you think about yourself as a boat, there's lots of different sections to your boat. There's, you know, friends, family, house, holiday, well, maybe not holidays, spirituality, physical exercise, time alone, hobbies. And I suppose think about how your boat is at the moment. And um, is it floating well? And we want to keep you afloat. Um, or how is it at the moment? And have a look at it and see, are there areas of my boat that I might need to um, uh, give a bit more time to and areas I might need to give a little less time to? Um, and I suppose what we know is that uh, it's very important when we're grieving to take care of ourselves. And sometimes we're, we're the last one that gets looked after. So I'd encourage you around this, around Christmas at the moment, and again, if you're grieving, be patient with yourself, be kind to yourself, look after yourself. Um, I love this quote from Anne Lamott, almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. Uh, and it's just that bit of allowing ourselves maybe to recharge. So I'm going to skip there because we're just running a little bit behind. Just in summary, we're in the middle of extraordinary times. Loss and grief are normal. Um, grieving is a process, it will take time. Um, it can be rocky and rough at times, but we do cope and things do change and we don't always feel the way we feel. Um, you need to honor your own grief and take care of yourself. Um, sharing our loss, as Maura pointed out earlier on and as Pauline Boss did in that video, it, it's actually good for us. Uh, sharing our loss with others. It helps us and it helps them. And creativity can also help. There is help available. Please reach out. Don't be on your own with your grief. And I know that Orla is going to say a little bit more about that now. Thank you so much, Brefni. That that really was great, and 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 a lot of input from video as well as talk. That I think um, people, judging by the questions and and the comments, indeed, have found very useful. So thank you. 
Um, and we're, we're just going to build on that briefly um, moving in now to look at, well, what supports are out there? Um, and uh, we're going to introduce, well, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Amanda Roberts. And Amanda is the development function of bereavement service at IHF. And she will talk to you about the, the range of supports that, that, that you might find helpful. So thank you, Amanda. Thanks a million, Orla. Um, I suppose the services are a really important part of our living with loss events, and you got a chance to meet some of them tonight with the, um, at the, sorry, just share my, my slide is not working there. Should be working there now, sorry. Um, the services are a really important part of our living and loss events, and you got a chance to meet some of them there earlier in the candle lighting ceremony. And normally when you attend the event, you walk in and the service of stands all around the room. And throughout, throughout the night, you can walk around the stands and have a chat to people from each of the services over a cup of tea. Having them in the room actually gives a real sense of what supports and services are out there, and that you don't have to be alone in your grief if you are struggling. In my day-to-day -day work, I have the privilege of working with many of these organizations that I will talk to you about tonight. So tonight I prepared a couple of slides about the range of organizations that operate around the country. I'm not gonna go into much, deal, de much detail about the, what they offer, but what we do have, we have slides that we'll show at the end of tonight. So as people are logging off, we have lots of information about all the different services. And then Iris is gonna send that slideshow on to people who have signed up for tonight's event. So firstly, before we kind of get into the services, what is bereavement care? And what do we mean when we say the care after bereavement? I suppose here in IHF, we view bereavement care in the shape of a pyramid. So our needs and what we find helpful can differ from person to person. We all have needs after the death of someone close. A lot of this support is provided by the people around us. This includes our family, our friends, our work colleagues and neighbors. This support can be acknowledgement from the people around us that the death has happened. It can be information, such as practical information, such as how to register a death or information and how grief can affect us. It can be practical support, such as someone to do the grocery shopping for us in the early days after a loss when we just can't face people. It can be also be emotional support, such as meeting someone for a cup of tea and a chat, or do something with a friend to escape from it all, such as going to the cinema or something that you can do just to get away from how you're feeling. Some of us need additional support for a variety of reasons. There's a range of bereavement support services across Ireland, and these additional supports can be grouped into three levels or categories. The first grouping of additional supports is here in yellow. Some of us may feel isolated from or not have access to a natural support network. We may find going through the details of our loss with someone outside of our circle of family and friends helpful, or we may seek to share our experience with other people who have experienced a similar loss to us. The service that may provide this type of support are peer support groups or meeting with a volunteer with some bereavement training to talk through our loss. The second group is here in orange. These support, the, the, the supports here are for those who experience more complex needs. Needs can be more complex for lots of different reasons. There may be other things going on in your life that makes the experience of the loss overwhelming, such as family conflict. The circumstances of the loss, such as a traumatic death, may mean that the person may need help in coping with their loss. And this is the counseling services will provide the level of support here. The final grouping of, of additional supports here is in blue, and a small number of people may, be, may need this level of support. This is provided by professionals who have extra training in helping people cope when they get stuck in their grief. That is when the pain of the grief does not seem to ease over time and that they're still struggling to function day to day. We use the pyramid a lot to show what we mean by bereavement care here in IHF. And in, and in summary, basically, it, it is acknowledgement and support from the people around us that we all need. The additional supports that some of us will need such as peer support, support from bereavement volunteers, or more intense support such as counselling. And then a small number of us will need the more intense supports offered by professionals with additional bereavement training. So now I'm just going to introduce you to, I suppose, how can you access these types of support in Ireland? 
Now, some services and supports are super specific to bereavement. Some of these offer support to a particular group of bereaved. It could be support based on how the person dies, for example, a death by cancer or suicide, farm accident, accident homicide or road traffic and collision. Some services are based on your relationship to the person who's died, for example, a pregnancy loss or after the death of a child, a partner, spouse or a sibling. Some services are not bereavement specific, such as information services, for example, citizens information. They provide information on tasks you may need to do after a death, such as registering a death or information about social welfare benefits that are available. In regards to counselling, some counsellors may have bereavement specific training, and but not all would have this bit of bereavement specific training. The first uh, set of group uh, services that I'm going to introduce you tonight is uh, supports for those who experience pregnancy loss or when a baby dies in and around the time of birth. And a little lifetime, Thalecon and the Miscarriage Association of Ireland are some of the organisations that support people who have experienced this type of loss. The type of supports these organisations offer include information and some offer through a website or booklets or leaflets. And this information can include practical information, information on ways this type of death may affect you and what some people might find helpful. Some offer remembrance services, others support groups. Failacon and Little Lifetime also offer a phone or helpline and a Little Lifetime also provide free counselling. And we have Deirdre here tonight from the Miscarriage Association of Ireland. At the end of the event tonight, we'll show a slideshow which will introduce you to Debbie, a volunteer from a Little Lifetime, and Carmel, a, vi a volunteer from Failacon. Our next group of services are supports for bereaved parents. Sharon, the founder and CEO of Anamkara, they, uh, they provide support to bereaved parents after death, the death of a child, and this includes adult children. They provide information through their website and booklets and leaflets. They have support groups and they also have bereavement information evenings. Georgia is the clinical director of First Light, and they provide support to bereaved parents after the sudden death of a child, and that's a child under 18. They offer free counselling and they also have a good network of counsellors based all around Ireland. The next group of services who provide support uh, for those bereaved through cancer or a life limiting Ill illness. And Ema is here tonight from Purple House. They provide a variety of supports to people bereaved by cancer. There is also bereaving support available in many of the hospices around the country. If your relative died under the care of the hospice, you can avail of their breathing supports. And these can include anything from a remembrance event, information evening, support from bereaved volunteers and counselling. Our next group of services are Pieta, Hug and Teres Nicola, and they offer support to those bereaved through suicide. Bernie is here tonight from Pieta, and she's one of the suicide bereaved liaison officers. And this liaison uh, service is available immediately following a death by suicide. Pieta also offer counselling for those bereaved by, by suicide. And this is generally a service provided a little while after the death. Fiona is the founder and, and CEO of Hug, and Hug offer a number of peer support groups around the country. Many of these are online due to COVID, so they can be accessed from across the country. And many of the services I talked to you about tonight, a lot of them have went online during COVID, and some of them have gone in part back face to face. So Catherine is here tonight from Tourist and Kayla. And one of the services they provide is the bereavement support, which is provided by trained volunteers. Another group of services that I'm going to introduce you tonight is around um, uh, farm accidents and deaths through um, road traffic collisions, collisions. So Norma is here tonight from Embrace Farm. And this is a farm accident support network, which offer information and remembrance events. And last year they published a book with stories by widows whose partners have died in a farm accident. Donna is the founder and CEO of Irish Road Victims Association, and they provide information and support for families of victims of road traffic and collisions. And in particular, they have a really good guide for families of victims, and it outlines the steps that might be involved after this type of death, such as the guard investigation, the post-mortem inquest and other legal proceedings. Another group are the, the group, um, both Advic actually and support after homicide, offer support to families and friends of homicide victims. And we have Marie here tonight from Advic, and some of the volunteers from support after homicide include Margaret, Liz and Trina. Colette is the founder of Widow.ie and provides support after the death of a partner. 
and it provides information and peer support through an online forum. And they also have guest writers that are right on particular issues that affect widows, such as experience accessing entitlement or coping with Christmas, or how to help a recently bereaved widow. Now, Bethany is one of the very few services actually we're open to all types of losses. And it's a free community-based service which supports bereaved adults. And you can log onto their website and they have a list of volunteers all across Ireland and also their contact details. One of the final group of services here I'm going to go through today is we have Eric here from the National Bereavement Support Line. And he's going to speak now after me. And this uh, support line provides a confidential space for people to speak about their experience or to ask questions in relation to the death of, of, the, of someone that they were close to. And this service is offered Monday to Friday from 10 o'clock in the morning to one o'clock in the afternoon. Also, just to give the, the I suppose the, the final grouping of services here is around um, kind of, I suppose, around the counselling and psychotherapy supports that are, are available. And I suppose just to say here is that not everyone who is looking for additional support will need counselling. Many find the support they need from the people around them, some from attending a support group or attending a support service provided by volunteers who have bereavement specific training. There are free, low cost and fee paying counselling services in Ireland, and some are outlined here in the slide. But again, we also have slides at the end of tonight where we'd have all the contact details from a variety of organisations. And again, this will be sent to you from IRIS. I suppose if you do feel you, you would like some additional support outside of family and friends and you see an organisation that you think might be helpful, look on their website or pick up the phone and give them a call. Or maybe you just don't know what you need. You may, could call the National Bereavement Support Line that, it, that will be open tomorrow morning. Or you could chat to your GP. And we've put together some slides again with more detailed information and we'll run it again for about 15 minutes after the event tonight and then we'll also send it out in the resource pack. I suppose these supports might be something you choose to avail of now or it might be something that you might take up later, later up down the road or you may see something that might help someone you know is struggling. Um, Thanks a million. Um, I hope that information has, some, has been helpful. But what we will do is we will have a lot of this information on the slides at the end of tonight. Thanks, Orla. Thank you so much, Amanda. And um, I think you 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 you've really provided an awful lot of direction there. Again, for people who may be needing help now. Or what we're seeing in the um, in the questions are people looking to help others. So there's a lot of direction there. And um, I think what we should also add is grief is a journey and you will need different things at different times. So it's it's very good to know what's out there. Thank you. You um, mentioned the bereavement support line, and I'm very pleased now to introduce a volunteer who works on that line um, and it's Eric and he's going to just tell you a little bit about his experience on being there on mornings and answering the phone to people who've suffered a loss. Thank you so much Eric. Uh, thank you Orla and Amanda and you're all very welcome. My name is Eric and I'm a volunteer on the Irish Hospice Foundation Bereavement Support Line and over the next few minutes I'd like to give you some insight into the line itself and the work that's done there and also my own perspective as a volunteer. Um, I think I need to note that COVID has um, interrupted so many things and um, it's for now we can't meet face to face to face. It's just not possible like we used to before. Um, but that day will come, I hope, and uh, for now it's a pleasure to meet you all online in, uh, in this medium for now. Um, the support line itself uh, was set up in partnership uh, between the Irish Hospice Foundation and the Health Services Executive, the HSE. And this is a, a free service which has been running since uh, June 2020. And all of the calls are answered by volunteers such as myself. Uh, the lines open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And you've seen it uh, all over uh, these presentations. The number is uh, 1800 80 70 
77 and it's right there uh, and the line will be open again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m uh, and the genesis of the the line is uh, has a relevance for us all i think in that you know i think covid may have uh, brought issues of loss and bereavement and uh, death and dying very much into the focus and we were bombarded with information and numbers and so on it was initially uh, that's all the news was full of and when the line was set up about half of the people who had called uh, called to talk about somebody they'd lost during the COVID pandemic while the restrictions were in place and these are quite significant issues and uh, the, the loss of a loved one and then uh, the loss of ceremony and celebration and so on. Um, and about 14 or 15% of the callers were actually uh, individuals who had lost somebody they love to the disease itself. So a very direct and uh, strong impact of the actual uh, disease. But there was also uh, about 16, 17% of people who called were in relation to a death that had occurred preceding the pandemic. Um, and this is possibly one of the messages I want to get across today is that this is not a, a COVID specific service. This is uh, a service for all bereavements. Um, and it's busy. The, uh, from January to November this year, there were 1,200 calls. And I think the main message that we want to uh, get out this evening is that if you think in any small way that this line might be relevant to you or useful to you, then it is. So please call. And um, as we've seen, as Orla has just said, the, but there's also other people you may be concerned about. So uh, this might be the right first stop uh, for you. Um, the main aim of the volunteers, I think, is that we want to make a direct personal contact, a connection with callers. And while doing that, to provide, hopefully, some comfort and support on the key aspects of their loss and bereavement. Um, and in some ways, you could term it as an emotional first aid. And I, I use that phrase carefully because, you know, first aid, as we might recall it, it's very much the first person there, one to one, an individual to an individual. Um, it's a confidential line. Um, and we hope that people will come to us and start to share their experiences. Um, as I say, questions, discussions about the death of somebody during COVID or indeed beforehand. So again, not necessarily just related to the times we find ourselves in. Um, my experience here, uh, certainly uh, I will echo everything. Uh, uh, so points made by all other speakers that Bereavement uh, and grief are such a unique event, yet ubiquitous, uh, eventually happening to all of us. Um, and all of the calls I have interacted with have been individual and unique in their own way. Um, but first and foremost, as volunteers, we listen uh, to what that person has to say, that caller has to say at that time. Um, and again, we hope to provide some comfort and emotional support. And certainly in my experience, there would be callers who will share very personal details of their own uh, bereavement, recent bereavements, very close family members, friends. Um, or indeed, it may be a case where somebody has been uh, listened to a song or been triggered by the change in the weather or whatever it might be. It might connect them back to their bereavement and they felt the need to talk to somebody about that. Um, and as Amanda has pointed out, and Brefany about practical supports, uh, we can steer people towards these supports at the, uh, within their community or the other organizations that you've uh, heard about this evening. And worth noting that um, this, the caller could be somebody who cares about somebody else and they're playing their supportive role in that person's grief. And, um, all are welcome in that regard. For me, it's quite uh, affirming that uh, I can feel a connection uh, with these people who call 
and I feel they're somehow supported. And that's certainly uh, some of the feedback I might get and that uh, the people express their gratitude and uh, relief maybe sometimes, and but definitely positive uh, feedback that they have run. Um, callers may just want to speak. They may, they may not speak. Uh, they, they might find that difficult. But certainly the impression it's left on me as, an, as a volunteer is that um, we all may need somebody to help us navigate how we feel. And this is the function of the support line. Um, certainly, I, I will echo and repeat, and I think it is worth repeating, points made by our other guests tonight in that the, the calls I've uh, had, uh, I've had uh, grief is expressed in so many different ways and there is certainly no wrong or right way to do this um, it's personal it's unique and callers may expect to hold themselves to some standard or to some set of rules and of course that doesn't work it's it's an individual experience there's no stages um, there was a roller coaster earlier on I, I would feel it ebbs and flows like 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 the tide, you know, it, it, it has a kind of almost a, a rhythm to it, but it's unexpected. It's not something we can maybe anticipate. It's personal. And certainly would, we would uh, help our callers by saying they shouldn't hold themselves to account or to a standard of somebody else. Um, callers, do you express their gratitude, which is a, a relief, actually, in some way? I'm so glad I've called you. In this moment, in this time, I feel relieved, and that is uh, a lovely thing to hear. Um, and indeed, some people are quite surprised that the line exists, and that's maybe part of, and I'll speak about it at the end, is um, we, we would like your help in spreading the word about the bereavement support line. Uh, very briefly about me, um, I have graduated from an educational course run by the Irish Hospice Foundation in conjunction with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And one of the things uh, I certainly took away from that course was I kind of gained a confidence, I think, to speak about death, dying, grief, loss, bereavement, uh, or indeed to be with or approach somebody who was having those feelings. And indeed, I had them myself while I was on that course and since. And I think uh, to advocate for the bereaved is uh, one of the reasons and pr probably the, the main reason why I volunteered. Um, and I can certainly see now that I've spoken to callers and other people I know that bereavement is entirely unique. Uh, it's almost a, a contradiction. It happens to everybody, but yes, it's entirely unique. There's no right or wrong way to do this. And we all may need some help. And definitely one of the messages is don't hesitate to ask be it the bereavement support line or your friends or your family or whomever um i i do strongly believe personally believe that those who call the bereavement support line do find some solace or support or maybe hope and it is a real privilege on, uh, for me to be part of that and to be with and to listen to the bereaved is a particularly unique privilege um, you may be aware of a, a radio campaign going on at the moment, and it's voiced by the actress Brenda Fricker. Um, so that's new, just recently released. And indeed, if you're online, you might see some online ads popping up, uh, displaying the number behind me. Uh, it could be a big step, I think, for somebody to pick up the phone or to look for support. But we would encourage anybody to call. And I say the number, it's bright and loud all over there 1800 80 70 77 it's a free service monday to friday 10 a.m to 1 p.m uh, if you don't immediately get an answer you can leave a message there'll be a call back and remember our aim and this is really important as a an overarching aim if you like is to provide um connection comfort and support to the bereaved and if you think it might work for you or somebody else that you know and are concerned about them, please call. We're here to listen to you. So uh, thank you for your time and attention. It's a pleasure to talk to you.
Thank you so much, Eric, uh, for yeah. for the the human face of of that uh, bereavement support line, and the very genuine invitation for people to to call at a time when it feels right for you. Um, Eric, thank you as well for sharing of your personal story, um, because I think that underlines that all the volunteers working on the line are first and foremost human beings. I'm going to just very briefly invite our speakers back um, and I'm just going to choose one of the questions um, to, to put to them because I think it links very well to, to just what Eric had, had said there about his experience. And it's a question from somebody and I'm going to just read it out word for word um, about, I suppose, about how to um, Sorry, my phone won't open for me now. That would be too easy. Here we go. Um, so this person is telling us that I find when I talk about a recent bereavement, it is challenging to feel heard as other people I speak to start to tell me about their experiences. I know they mean well, but I feel very isolated. I don't want to be selfish and ask for what I need as it may come across that I don't care about other people's stories, which isn't the case. Any advice on how to ask to be listened to in a way that doesn't invalidate other people's experience? So mm. really, really thoughtful question there. Yeah, I'd say be selfish. <laughs> find find someone that, that you can be yourself with. and. When we're grieving, oftentimes it's not that people mean ill towards us, but sometimes it may be difficult for people to go there or they can't go there. But there are some people who can and maybe search out and, and be selective towards those who uh, will listen to you uh, and just allow you to be yourself however you are and who will validate your loss. Sometimes it's surprising the people that we might expect might be able to support us, just might not be able to at that time. And there may be others who come out of the woodwork that you wouldn't have thought um, that would be able to support you who actually will. Um, there's a little bit of risk taking in it in that sometimes it's a bit trial and error and, and uh, uh, seeking out somebody. Uh, the important thing is that they will listen to you and validate you and allow you to be however you want to be or however you are and just meet that. And um, there are people out there who can do that. Um, and there may be people in your close circle who may be able to do that, and you might be surprised at that. Um, but I would say to, to search a bit for it and, and be selfish around it and, and make sure you're entitled to, to have your loss validated. Um, you're entitled to have somebody who will listen to you. Um, there are people out there who will do that. And I would encourage you to, to try that and, uh, you know, to, to put yourself first in this instance. And also, it's, it's, it's not about, um, uh, you know, dismissing people. Just sometimes people just aren't there. They're just not able to, to be with us at this moment in this way. But there are other ways that people could be, uh, uh, could be with us. And there are other people who will be able to be with you. So um, I would encourage you to, to look around and uh, to be a bit selfish about it. Thank you, Breffney. And as you said, some people may disappoint, but others will surprise. Mm. So keep keep looking. Thank you, Breffney. And more, Armand, anything striking you there? I mean, I suppose one of the things that happens, and we mentioned it earlier, is that even within a family, we all are different. Um, we all have different reactions. And sometimes, you know, you almost feel like you're competing within a family for your different style and way of grieving and as Brethany said you really just have to be yourself and be true to yourself and allow yourself to to you know I mean there's times when you have to listen to things that you may not really want to be listening to because you feel like it's not supportive but there are other times that you have to as Brethany said go and find your supports find the people who let you have the rants who listen or even sometimes within family sometimes to say okay that's your way of dealing with it. Can we, and I'm there for you, but maybe sometimes can we look at my way of dealing with it and maybe you'd be there for me at that time so that at least you're not dismissing other people, but you're, you're letting them know that there are different ways and, you know, whichever, whatever works for you is going to work for you. 
Thank you, Maura. And that's lovely, even almost practicing how you would how you would have the conversation. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Amanda, anything you wanted to add? I suppose just echoing echoing what uh, Brefley and Maura said and telling people what you need. Because sometimes when you tell people this, they don't know what to say or don't know what to, to do. And it's easier, maybe easier to say to try and make a connection and say, well, this is how I or this will happen to me. So just been up front from the start saying, I actually just need you to sit there and listen to me or mm. you know, do the nodding every now and again. And that it's OK to just sit there and listen and nod. I don't want you to fix it. So it's all this I think the communication and being clear with people what you need is really important. And that could be really hard sometimes. But sometimes when people are there trying to support you, if you tell them what to do, it actually makes it easier for them too. Mm. Lovely. Very wise, the three of you. And yeah. I think um, the linking again to what Eric said, don't judge yourself in your grief. Um, it's OK to be selfish. That can be a part of grief, maybe, as is anger. And we had several um, uh, questions coming up about, you know, feeling angry, you know, and anger is a hard part of grief because maybe you haven't expected it. So grief will challenge us all. Um, I'm really sorry that that's the height of the questions because we don't we're running out of time. Um, but what we are going to do, as mentioned earlier, we're going to keep the Q&A open to make sure we've answered any of the typed questions. So that will be there for the next 15 minutes. Um, we'll be here. Uh, so feel free to to type something in and we'll definitely get back. And you've heard about, you know, maybe how to get some more information. And we will also email the content of today out to you all. Um, I, I would like to uh, thank really everybody for participating today um, and for and for giving of your experience and your wisdom and your and your persons. Um, there are some people in the background, uh, Jen and Lorraine and Iris in particular, who who've organized the, the event and it takes a bit of organizing. So um, our sincere thanks to them. We're going to end though with, with a little reading. Um, and uh, just as we, maybe we'll go back and at the beginning, we talked about lighting the candles and we had uh, that lighting ceremony, um, reminding us that there's always somewhere a chink of light if, if we look for it and if we can hold it close. Um, to end our evening, we're going to extinguish the light, but each of these people are going to light their candles in the future, and it will have the same meaning and the same potential for hope and support when they relight them. And what our wish is for you that maybe over Christmas, when you light your candle in tribute or in memory to someone, that you get some piece of comfort from that. Um, so I'll ask all our services to extinguish their candles. And then I'm going to pass over to Lorraine, who's going to do a reading of On Grief by poet John O'Donoghue. And as I said, then we will disappear, but the question and answer system will be left on in the background. And thank you for being here this evening. Goodbye. Lorraine. Thank you, Orla. As Orla said, this poem is For Grief by John O'Donoghue. When you lose someone you love, your life becomes strange. The ground beneath you becomes fragile. Your thoughts make your eyes unsure. And some dead echo drags your voice down where words have no confidence. Your heart has grown heavy with loss. And though this loss has wounded others too, no one knows what has been taken from you when the silence of absence deepens. Flickers of guilt kindle regret for all that was left said and undone. There are days when you wake up happy again inside the fullness of life until the moment breaks and you are thrown back onto the black tide of loss. Days when you have your heart back, you are able to function well until in the middle of work or encounter, suddenly with no warning, you are ambushed by grief. It becomes hard to trust yourself. All you can depend on now is that sorrow will remain faithful to itself. 
More than you, it knows its way and will find the right time to pull and pull the rope of grief until that coiled hill of tears has reduced to its last drop. Gradually, you will learn acceptance with the invisible form of your departed. And when the work of grief is done, the wound of loss will heal and you will have learned to wean your eyes from that gap in the air and to be able to enter the hearth in your soul where your loved one has awaited your return all the time. Thank you. Out among the daffodils this morning I looked upon the garden as my blessing I let a stream run down my face The sadness flowed my every vein And wash, wash, wash over me As we grieve across an ocean And set our flame for all who pass us by So near and yet so far away A backlit version of a face I love Will carry me through There is a among the daffodils this morning I looked upon the garden as my blessing I let a stream run down my face the 
sadness flood my every vein and wash, wash, wash over me. There is a rainbow after every storm. Be with us as we grieve across an ocean. Set our flame for all who passes by. So near and yet so far away. A backlit version of a face I love will carry me through. There is a rainbow after every storm. There is a bird who. But we need not pretend our hearts aren't aching For every fleeting moment we won't share I hope the clouds will part tonight So we can ask the same old lie to watch, watch, watch Out among the daffodils this morning I looked upon the garden as my blessing I let a stream run down my face The sadness flood my every vein And wash, wash, wash over me Be with us as we grieve across an ocean And set our flame for all who passes by So near and yet so far away A backlit version of a face I love Will carry me through
Out among the daffodils this morning I looked upon the garden as my blessing I let a stream run down my face The sadness flood my every vein And wash, wash, wash over me Be with us as we grieve across an ocean And set our flame for 